Well, good afternoon. Uh, we'll begin uh, the G20 special session three. Uh, my name is Teho Bark. I'm a professor at uh, Seoul National University, Graduate School of International Studies. I'm very uh, delighted and also it's an honor for me to uh, moderate this special session because we have a very distinguished scholar, uh, Professor Ha Jun Chang, uh, is, is speaking this, in this session. Uh, if you look at the program book, uh, it has very detailed uh, 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 background of Professor Chang. He's a professor of economics at the uh, University of Cambridge. Uh, he has been teaching there uh, since uh, 1990. And uh, I don't want to read all the uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, his background, but uh, he wrote uh, many, many articles and also he authored also very numerous books. He got uh, lots of uh, prize on his academic activities. So you can refer to a program book. And in addition, he has been uh, consulting uh, for many uh, international organizations, including uh, UNCTAD, UNDP, World Bank, and so on. And also he consulted uh, for many different governments, including some developing countries and also advanced countries. Um, so uh, why don't you look at the uh, uh, program book uh, and uh, refer to uh, uh, that uh, section for Professor Chang. In this session, uh, he'll be uh, presenting a, a, a paper, uh, a topic, uh, G20 Seoul Agenda from a non-G20 perspective, which will be a very, very interesting uh, topic because uh, in Korea, and especially in Seoul, we all talk about G20. I think that's why this HR uh, forum uh, provides a special session on G20. Uh, I think Professor Chang will speak uh, about uh, half an hour or 40 minutes, and then uh, we'll open the floor so that uh, you can raise many comments and, and questions. So I would like to invite uh, Professor Chang. Would you please uh, join me in welcoming him? Thank you, Professor Park, uh, for that kind introduction. Yes, I'm uh, extremely honored uh, to have been asked uh, to address uh, this session. The G20 is, of course, uh, a very significant event which uh, deserves a lot of uh, congratulations, but we should not forget that uh, there are countries that have not been invited to this party, and we should uh, try to think uh, what uh, this uh, new initiative will do for them. Well, the launch of the G20 in 2008 was a watershed in the evolution of the global economic governance system. Of course, uh, the developing countries are dominant in numerical terms, uh, both in terms of their population, but also in terms of their uh, number. Yeah? So there are, I mean, depending on how you define developed countries, probably around 30 developed countries. The rest of the world is made up of developing countries, and their combined population is, uh, uh, especially thanks to China and India, uh, the majority of the world. But despite this, uh, developing countries have uh, historically had very little say in the management of the global economy over the last few centuries. Between the early 19th century and the Second World War, all of today's developing countries were either officially colonies or they were forced to sign what are known as unequal treaties that deprive them of the right to set their own policies, such as tariff or interest rate. After the Second World War, these countries started gaining independence, 
and they were made members of the United Nations and all that. So at least in theory, each country had one vote. I mean, of course, uh, you can always uh, uh, debate whether it is actually fair to give one vote to China with 1.3 billion people and also one vote to uh, Latvia with 2.2 uh, million people. But I mean, uh, still, that, uh, this uh, one country, one vote uh, uh, representation in the UN is uh, significant. Of course, uh, we know that in the United Nations, uh, five permanent members of uh, the Security Council have uh, vetoes. So it's not exactly you know, one country, one vote, but you know, it uh, approximates that. And uh, the, therefore, the, this was a big step. But despite this, uh, the developing countries still had little say in the management of the global economy. Why? Because uh, since uh, their launch in 1944, the IMF, or the International Monetary Fund, and the World Bank have been the two main pillars of uh, global economic management. But unlike the United Nations, these organizations are run basically on the basis of one dollar, one vote system. Huh? Moreover, the United States uh, have a de facto veto in the IMF and the World Bank, because for the most important decisions, you require 85% majority. And the United States owns 18% of the share. So the United States can block anything it doesn't want. If other countries want to block something, the next five countries have to gang up together. So the US dominance is actually quite uh, remarkable there. Now, on top of uh, the IMF and the World Bank, uh, since the mid-1970s, macroeconomic uh, policy coordination has been mainly decided among the so-called G7 countries. And obviously, there was uh, no representation by a developing country because it was all made up of uh, the rich countries. Hmm? However, despite this uh, structure, until the 1980s, the developing countries had a relatively high degree of freedom in their policy choices. This was partly because of the competition with the Soviet bloc. You know, there was a time when developing countries could uh, credibly, and then India in particular played this uh, card very, very cleverly, uh, credibly that, that tell the Western bloc that, well, that if you don't treat us uh, that uh, well, we will uh, go and talk to the you know, uh, Soviet Union. And partly because uh, the, the rich countries uh, the, had this colonial guilt, especially the French and the British, the leading West, Western powers are more willing to give uh, space to developing countries during this period. So for example, in the GATT, which is the predecessor of the WTO, The focus was mainly on trade liberalization among the rich countries. Yeah? And the developing countries are given the choice not to sign into any agreement uh, that they didn't like. Yeah? In contrast, today in the WTO, there's uh, this notion of single undertaking. So if you want to become a member of the WTO, you have to sign up to every agreement, yeah? even though you might feel that some of them are not uh, really beneficial for you. Hmm? However, since the 1980s, uh, with the memory of colonialism fading and with the decline and uh, eventually collapse of the Soviet bloc and with the rise of market fundamentalism in their own economic thinking, the developed countries have become much more aggressive in demanding that uh, developing countries adopt what they consider to be good policies. In the 1980s, especially after the 1982 Third World Debt Crisis, Using their dominance in the IMF and the World Bank, the rich countries implemented the so-called structure adjustment programs that pushed for a one-size-fits-all package of trade liberalization, deregulation, and privatization in the developing countries, or what is sometimes known as uh, the Washington Consensus Agenda. Yeah? So the, the thinking behind this uh, view was that there is uh, one good 
policy package that everyone should use. Yeah? And it doesn't matter, you know, I mean, the, the, the argument at the time was that, uh, look, uh, economics is a science. Yeah? I mean, so the, what works in Germany should work in Ghana. What works in the United States uh, should work in Ecuador. So the, every country should uh, use the, the same policy. Yeah? Would you recommend that uh, Ghana develops its own chemistry and Ecuador develops its own physics? No, you wouldn't. So the, the, they should the, the follow this uh, the standard package. Now, of course, uh, these uh, policies didn't bring a great result. Actually, in sub-Saharan Africa, the results were, I mean, close to disastrous. Uh, you know, after uh, 30 years of uh, structural reform, these countries' uh, average per capita income is more or less where it used to be in 1980. Yeah? Because that, uh, during the last uh, 30 years, Africa has grown at something like 0.2% per year. Yeah? But uh, even when all these policies uh, didn't prove very effective in promoting economic development, they were continued because the developing countries suffering from them had very little say in developing, sorry, uh, deciding what policies to adopt. And even in the WTO, which uh, has one country, one vote system, and with no uh, formal or informal veto, developing countries still have not had the influence that you would guess uh, from this uh, the voting rule, because uh, the organization is supposed to work through consensus, and therefore votes are never taken. You know, consensus uh, sounds great, but given the disparities in the bargaining power between the member states, this in practice means that the rich countries are able to get their way most of the time. Not always, but most of the time. You know, Let me give you just uh, one illustration of the disparities in bargaining power. I have a, a friend uh, who works for a major international aid agencies, uh, agency, and he has a friend from Kenya who is a very the, the, the vocal critic uh, of uh, his uh, government's policy. But apparently the, the, when he went to the WTO ministerial meeting in Cancun in 2003, he was the most popular guy among the Kenyan delegation. Why? Because he was the guy with uh, the only guy with a laptop. Yeah? You know, his uh, agents in England bought him a laptop Kenyan civil servants didn't even have a laptop, so when they had to write something for their minister, they had to go and beg this guy, huh? can I use it uh, for a couple of hours? Yeah? You know, and then you call this uh, negotiation. Yeah? I mean, that, uh, some people don't even have a laptop, others have uh, 70 people working on yeah, intellectual property rights alone. Yeah? And of course, that, uh, in the in behind scene negotiations, a lot of uh, the weaker developing countries are put under pressure from the rich countries. Yeah? If you don't listen to us, we are going to cut our aid. Yeah? We are going to uh, make your life difficult. Huh? Now, while all this was going on, the relative economic power of the developing countries was growing, yeah? especially with the rise of uh, China, India, and so on. And by the turn of the 21st century, the distribution of voting rights in the IMF and the World Bank look hopelessly outdated, except for Japan having enormously increased its uh, share in these organizations in the 60s and 70s. Hardly any change was made in the voting shares, so the, the distribution of votes in these organizations reflected uh, the distribution of economic power of 1944, essentially, yeah, when they had the Bretton Woods Conference, rather than the new realities of the 21st century. Yeah? But uh, the little was done. Okay, I mean, a couple of years ago, the, the voting shares for Korea, Mexico, China, and one or two other countries were increased, but only very marginally. And the rich countries, especially the smaller European countries who have uh, declined in absolute as uh, relative terms, have uh, resisted these uh, changes uh, fiercely. 
So the very little the change uh, happened. But the important an important turning point was reached with the 2008 financial crisis, with the US, the UK, and other rich countries plunging into the second deepest recession since the Great Depression. And G20 did uh, exist even before, but you know it was uh, uh, revamped. And finally, in 2009, the new distribution of economic powers recognized and the G20 officially replaced the G7 as the main international policy coordination body. Now, the launch of the G20 was a very important event, but we have to put it into perspective. First of all, it is only one element, and not even necessarily the most important element in the system of global economic governance. There's the IMF, the World Bank, the WTO, the yeah, BIS, and so on. And developing country representation in those organizations have not been increased, well, except yeah, for the latest news that, uh, from Gyeongju that the Europeans have agreed to give up two seats on the board of the IMF to make space for developing countries. Unfortunately, this uh, the slide was made uh, the, the, a few days before that, so that it isn't reflected there. So there was uh, a bit of a change, but uh, essentially, the power structure in those organizations remain the same. And yes, uh, I agree that uh, the very presence of G20 may eventually increase the influence of the developing countries in the other parts of the global governance system in the way you know, the, the, the developing countries gained two seats uh, on the IMF uh, board uh, recently. But how far this will go, I do not know, and it's uh, certainly going to take time. Now, having said all this, uh, I would argue that the G20 is uh, definitely an improvement over G7, which uh, represented only seven countries and about 700 million people. The G20 includes some de uh, key developing countries as well as the smaller European countries represented through the European Union. Actually, the, 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 the EU has one seat, so actually in terms of individual countries, there are only nine, uh, 19, and some European countries are doubly represented because uh, they have a seat and then they're also represented by the EU, so it's uh, quite complicated. But uh, if you include the EU countries, uh, the G20 represents something like an additional 3.3 .3 billion people. So the altogether about uh, the 4 billion, about two-thirds of the uh, world's population. But uh, this means, uh, however, that uh, there are still around 2.5 billion and around 150 countries in this world that the G20 does not represent. Of course, uh, the G20 will better represent the interests of developing countries than the G7, as it includes several developing countries, China, India, Indonesia, Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, South Africa, and probably Korea. I, I say probably because uh, it's a special case. You know, I mean, uh, Korea uh, today is usually classified as a developed economy, but it's uh, the, one of the poorest, yeah? developed economies uh, with uh, per capita income around $2,000. It's uh, well below the OECD average. And also it has come out of the developing country status uh, so recently that it still keeps uh, some characteristics of a developing country even today, such as a very small welfare state and the prevalence of small firms in the service sector. Now, the fact that uh, several developing countries uh, are represented in the G20 does not guarantee that they will adequately represent the interests of all developing countries because these countries are not typical ones. They are all big countries in terms, terms of population. The median population of uh, developing countries is about uh, 20 million. The smallest developing country in the G20 is Argentina with uh, 40 million people, and not to speak of yeah, the giants of uh, the China and India. I mean, uh, Indonesia's got uh, the, the 220 million people, Brazil's got, what, 160 million, and so on. So 
these are all very big countries. Also, in terms of income level and economic structure, they tend to be richer, more industrialized, and more diversified than most other developing countries. Of course, uh, these all do not necessarily go together. I mean, India is, you know, despite its size and despite its uh, relatively sophisticated uh, uh, capabilities in certain sectors, in general, it's a very poor country, uh, barely with a $1,000 per capita income and lots of uh, structural problems. Uh, so, I mean, I'm not saying that they are all yeah, richer, more industrialized, and more diversified, but uh, they are at least one of these. And being richer, bigger, and more economically advanced than most other developing countries, uh, the developing country members of the G20 may not be natural advocates, things that worry other smaller, poorer, and economically vulnerable countries. For example, a lot of uh, smaller developing countries tend to rely on one yeah, type of uh, the natural resource export, yeah, be it coffee or copper or whatever. Yeah. So these uh, economies are very sensitive to price uh, fluctuation in the international commodity market. Yeah. And therefore, uh, they have a uh, greater interest in the setting up, say, commodity, stabilize, uh, commodity price uh, stabilization fund than other related things. Whereas uh, the, uh, China isn't probably that interested, yeah? probably yeah? Uh, the Korea isn't all that interested. Yeah? Also, being richer and bigger means that these countries have better bargaining power and negotiation skills than do most other developing countries, so they can defend their interests better. Yeah? This means that uh, they are not as dependent on there being good rules that better protect the weak as other developing countries are. You know, the, the very interesting uh, the example is India. You know, the, it is, in general, a very poor country, but it's large and has a very well-educated uh, elite, and they have been very effective in the international negotiations because they have that resource. Yeah? But uh, the, there are 22 countries that do not even have an embassy in Geneva. Yeah? So the, yeah, they may, in theory, have a voting right in the WTO, but you know, they don't even have a single person uh, sitting there, at least collecting the, yeah, uh, the press release. Yeah? So how can they uh, effectively negotiate? Yeah? So all this uh, means that the G20 should increase uh, representation for poorer, smaller, and vulnerable developing countries. I mean, of course, that, uh, you cannot have all of them there, but uh, you should yeah, allocate some additional seats uh, to these countries that, uh, so that yeah, they could collectively yeah, kind of, uh, rotate or elect uh, certain countries as uh, their representatives. Huh? And, of course, increased representation of developing countries in the G20 should also be paralleled by the increase in the representation of weaker countries in other parts of the global governance system. Given this concern, namely that uh, the G20 may not adequately reflect uh, the interests of smaller and weaker developing countries, the proposal to include development of low-income countries as a key item in the G20 agenda this uh, proposal was uh, made by the Korean government as the chair of this year's uh, the, the G20 is a very welcome move because uh, the, unless uh, someone speaks up for these countries, no one's going to. The issue paper which uh, the Korean government has produced in order to initiate this discussion make many good points. First of all, it uh, rejects uh, the old one-size-fits-all approach of the Washington Consensus and advocates what it calls a dynamic iPhone approach where countries have a broad menu of you know, uh, apps, as they say, to select from. You know? So the, no ready-made package. There are all these... Uh, that, 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 Ideas on offer, countries can pick and choose. Yeah? This is a big improvement uh, the, over the one-size-fits-all approach of uh, Washington Consensus. Secondly, it strongly emphasizes uh, infrastructure investment, which uh, 
actually, that, that used to be the main mandate of the World Bank. I mean, World Bank was uh, the, the set up as a bank to finance infrastructure development, but over time, the importance of infrastructure has been forgotten, and I think uh, this is a very welcome addition to the agenda. Thirdly, it uh, proposes to pay close attention to remittances, and I think this is uh, to be highly commended. You know, most people do not know that uh, for many countries, remittances are from workers who migrated uh, usually temporarily to other countries, yeah, Middle East, Korea, England, or wherever, is often bigger, much bigger than foreign aid provided by yeah, uh, the rich countries. Yeah? So uh, these are very important flows, but uh, uh, since uh, they do not have uh, political visibility, people don't even know that uh, these flows are so big. Yeah? So including this in the agenda uh, is a very positive thing, but there are some important issues that are underplayed or even neglected in the, this uh, the issue paper, and they are particularly trade and industrial policies and policies to enhance uh, equity. Now, the Korean government's uh, issue paper rightly emphasizes uh, the importance of international trade for economic development. International trade is crucial for economic development because without international trade, developing countries cannot get access to advanced technologies whose absence is in the end what makes them poor. You know, unless you earn hard currency, unless you earn US dollar or euro or whatever by exporting, you cannot buy better machines, you, know, you cannot buy the, the, the technological licenses. And without those technologies, you will forever remain poor. So in that sense, uh, the international trade is uh, the, the key to economic development, but that does not mean that free trade is the best trade policy, as today's economic orthodoxy says, and as the Korean government's issue paper implicitly accepts. I mean, it doesn't quite the, the explicitly advocate the view, but uh, that's what is underlying it, because the paper suggests that uh, the best way to help developing countries benefit from international trade is to maximize their access to rich country markets while increasing foreign aid to those countries to improve their ability to trade, especially through increased infrastructural investment. Yeah? So you, you, you know, open new ports or the, the lay down the, the, the railways and so on so that uh, they have more access uh, the, the, to export market. Huh? But I would say that this is uh, fundamentally at odds with how Korea itself has developed, as uh, many of you know. you know. In the early stages of economic development, Korea used a mixture of protectionism, regulation on foreign investment, lax intellectual property rights, and occasional use of uh, state-owned enterprises in order to nurture and develop high productivity industries like steel, automobile, electronics, and shipbuilding, which are now the main pillars of the Korean economy. Now, when I say this, uh, people say, oh, okay, Korea might have done it that way, but you know, which other country has done it? Yes, uh, Japan, but all the other rich countries have become rich through free trade and free market. But in a number of uh, the, the, the articles and books, I have argued that starting from 18th century Britain through to 19th century US, Germany, and Sweden, down to 20th century France, Finland, Norway, and Austria, virtually all of today's rich countries became rich by using policies similar to what Korea used. And of course, uh, this was not a coincidence uh, because there are very respectable economic theories that justify these policies. I don't know how uh, the show went in there, but uh, you can uh, read it uh, without it. So given this, uh, the discussion of trade and development in the Korean government's issue paper is uh, highly problematic. There has to be a proper discussion on the relative merits and demerits of different types of uh, trade industrial policy. I mean, you may not necessarily advocate uh, what 
Korea used uh, the, in the 1960s and 70s, but at least there should be a recognition that that is a viable option. Yeah? There should be a recognition that that option was actually used by many other countries uh, that uh, reach today. Yeah? And, and uh, the allowing those policies might involve changes in the policies of the uh, sorry, rules of the WTO or changes in the policies of the IMF and the World Bank, and all these have to be properly discussed. Yeah? In the end, the conclusion might be that yeah, you know, so many things have changed. Maybe it, uh, it is that, uh, better to have uh, much more liberal trade than uh, what Korea had in the 60s, or uh, that, that uh, we should uh, keep most of the current WTO rules that are in place because uh, the, after all things considered, is that, uh, that they are still the best rules. You know, I mean, that, uh, that kind of conclusion may be drawn, but at least it has to be drawn after a, a proper process of uh, deliberation. You can't just yeah, whitewash uh, the, 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 the history and say, well, you know, everyone became rich through free trade and free market, and developing countries should uh, uh, do it, yeah, even if they uh, don't want it. Yeah? If the developing country members of the G20 buy into the G7 mantra that free trade is good and that the main issue for developing countries is uh, market access, I think uh, they will be doing a great disservice to non-G20 developing countries. Yeah? because uh, countries like uh, India and China can achieve uh, some of the effects of uh, the policies used by, for example, you know, Japan or Korea in the 60s and 70s, even without changing the global rules. You know? For example, China th th didn't regulate uh, foreign investment that severely in the way Korea or Japan did because it had a huge internal market and a lot of bargaining power. So actually, even without uh, formally demanding that foreign investors uh, should uh, uh, actively transfer technology to the joint venture partner, the Chinese government could put informal pressure on the foreign multinational companies to do that. And these companies listen to it because uh, they don't want to be on the wrong side of the Chinese uh, the government. Smaller countries cannot do that, so they need actually rules that make it possible for them to demand these things. Yeah? Another issue that needs uh, great attention in the G20 is uh, that of equity. There's some recognition of uh, this issue in the uh, issues paper by the Korean government. For example, it emphasizes uh, the importance of inclusive finance and greater access uh, to education and training. And I uh, load uh, the Korean government for including those things. But you know, there are many other policies that need considering if you are promote uh, non, sorry, more equitable development in non-G20 developing countries than what today's orthodoxy says is possible and then what is yeah, laid out in the paper by the Korean government. For example, land reform has been taken off the policy agenda for decades. But it can bring about great benefits in terms of uh, promoting equity, as it did in the case of Korea itself. I mean, of course, uh, land reform requires uh, certain other conditions. I'm not saying that it is the right solution for all the developing countries, but you know, at least uh, this has to be considered. And it's actually quite ironic that, that uh, we once again you know, whitewash our own history and don't even mention land reform as a policy possibility. Huh? Also, in addition to education and training, which is uh, discussed in the issues paper, healthcare and other social policies need to be discussed if you are going to have a fully yeah, kind of a equitable development uh, strategy. Also, if you are going to make what the issue paper calls inclusive finance work, we need to discuss how best to supply key productive inputs uh, the, to those uh, who are getting this uh, the, the access to finance that are either too bulky or that have public good nature, 
which markets are very bad at efficiently providing. You know, for example, there's an interesting example that uh, from the former Yugoslavia uh, in the Croatian Republic, there was this uh, microfinance company which uh, supplied farmers with a lot of small loans. Yeah? I mean, the intention was good, you know, these farmers uh, the, the, uh, wanted to expand, they uh, got access to loans. But unfortunately, what happened was that uh, all these farmers bought one more cow. Yeah? And they, therefore, more or less uh, doubled the supply of milk uh, in the local market. The milk price collapsed and they all yeah, got into financial trouble. Now, this kind of thing would not have happened if uh, the, this microcredit was also supported by cooperatives. Mm -hmm. you know, the reason why Denmark uh, had uh, great success with uh, agriculture export was because these farmers, small farmers, were organized into cooperatives which bought processing facilities uh, that are expensive to buy for individual farmers. Yeah? So they could turn their extra milk into butter and cheese. They could yeah, have a slaughterhouse uh, to yeah, kill all these pigs and uh, make bacon and export it uh, to England and Germany. Yeah? But if you don't have these kind of things, I mean, what can an individual farmer do with extra milk, uh, extra cow? Yeah? Produce more milk. Yeah? But the milk is uh, very perishable. You cannot export milk uh, to another country and, uh, unless you process it. And the result was the collapse in the local milk market and uh, the, this microfinance uh, the scheme more or less uh, led to a the, the, the disaster. Yeah? So we need to uh, discuss uh, options like uh, agriculture cooperatives uh, that, that can supply these uh, the kind of productive inputs uh, that are beyond individual farmers, uh, uh, but uh, that kind of discussion is uh, missing. Huh? Well, uh, to conclude, uh, the establishment of G20 has been a watershed in the evolution of global economic governance. Yeah? I mean, despite my partial criticisms that, that uh, let us uh, recognize its uh, importance. But unless the developing country members of uh, the G20 and Korea as a country that still you know, straddles uh, the two worlds take extra care, they may fail to adequately represent other developing countries. And in this regard, the Korean government's push for greater emphasis on economic development in the G20 agenda is most welcome. However, the development agenda uh, proposed by the Korean government has two important gaps, as I mentioned, yeah? trade and industrial policy and policies that enhance equity. Actually, uh, in my view, it is a great pity that the Korean government is unable or unwilling to talk about, e talk about even policies that have uh, benefited itself, yeah? you know, such as uh, infant industry protection and land reform, yeah? because these things are yeah, supposed to be bad, uh, according to the orthodox uh, the economic thinking. Huh? So unless we adopt a more comprehensive and open-minded development agenda, the G20 might turn into another forum where an expanded group of stronger countries make decisions that adversely affect weaker countries or at least uh, neglect uh, the issues that help uh, those countries. And I really hope uh, it doesn't uh, uh, evolve uh, that way. And uh, let me uh, conclude my lecture there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Chang. Uh, his presentation is very useful, especially uh, to the organizer of G20. Uh, in Korea, because uh, Korea did some work uh, on many things, but uh, he has uh, good you know, comments, uh, especially on development issues and other uh, trade and industrial policy issues and equity issues. Uh, I hope uh, we still have some several days or even more than 10 days to uh, finalize our preparation, maybe uh, 
uh, they can you know, raise these kind of issues during the discussion of the summit meeting. Well, I have my own little comments, but I will do that later. But um, we'll open the floor so that uh, anybody can ask que questions or give comments on uh, Professor Chang's uh, presentation. If you want to do that, very briefly introduce yourself and be brief because we want to invite other, other people's you know, comments. And we'll end this session uh, exactly at uh, 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 5.40. So you have to keep that in mind, OK? You have a question? Yes. Good afternoon. Afante from the Philippines. And this morning, we heard uh, Atali in the morning session say that actually we would expect G2, not G20 meeting. It will be an affair between China and, and the United States. And the agenda, this, this uh, magnanimous agenda will be. Uh, so I was so happy to see this agenda. But how, how do we see this forward? I mean, we have, to, we have to do a lot of talking and negotiating with the other countries. And after Seoul, I mean, G20 is now uh, very good. We, we, we pay a lot of attention, but there are many other hidden landmines along the way. Uh, after Seoul, after November, what happens? There's a lot of tensions, not only in currency, but in other uh, imbalances in other parts of the world. So, so uh, what do you think uh, happens after Seoul? Thank you very much. We'll collect a few more questions or comments, and then Professor Zhang will uh, respond uh, all together. Any other? Yes, back there. I want to speak in Korea. Why don't you introduce yourself, who you are, briefly? Yes, Korea University, Computer Science, Annyeonghaa. I don't know much about G20, but I don't know much about G20. 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 좀 궁금합니다. Any other? Yes, the gentleman. Yeah. My name is Kon uh, Ho Song from Anna University uh, MBA. Uh, I want to ask about uh, uh, Korea EU FTA. Uh, you talked about the FTA and and. I believe the you know, Korean government have to, has to uh, develop an infant industry and some MNCs, you know, uh, co other companies. And the, what do you think about uh, the best uh, strategies uh, to uh, protect the uh, domestic industry and some MNCs? Let me introduce my, myself. I'm working in the Korean Construction Industry Research Institute, Bongnam Ni. I fully agree your emotionally agree your opinion. But practically, if you expand the number of countries, developing countries, it's big size. Consensus is very difficult. I don't think G20 is a, a decision maker. They not uh, given to authority, but uh, they should do a leadership in uh, leading the remaining countries. How about your opinions? Then? Um, good afternoon. I'm a student of Hankook Academy of Foreign Studies, and um, I want to ask that um, what giving representations to um, poorer and weaker developing countries will um, give them more bargaining powers and negotiation skills in the G20. Because what I think is that there will still be a lot of pressure and threats from the stronger nations. 
Okay, uh, we want to do the first round of discussion, so we'll close the collection of questions and let uh, Professor Chang respond, and then we open the second round, and I will ask you to raise a question. Professor Thank Chang, you. yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, the, I think uh, Mr. Atali made very interesting comment. Uh, G2 is uh, really G20, uh, uh, G20 is really G2. Yeah, I think uh, there's a lot in that. Uh, but, you know, the very fact that uh, there are other countries uh, does make a difference. But, of course, uh, all these countries have uh, different uh, goals, different domestic interests, yeah, different outlooks. So, yes, I mean, the, the Korea still the, the has a kind of a solidarity with uh, developing countries. It tries to push this uh, development agenda, but next year is uh, France, uh, the, the chair country. I mean, France uh, wants to push uh, other things. So, I mean, there'll be always uh, the, the conflict of that kind, but, you know, at least uh, the, having this uh, the, uh, debate uh, will be useful in the, in the long run advancing uh, new issues. Huh? And is uh, the Korea there as uh, the representative of a developing country? No, actually, I mean, it isn't there as a representative of a developing country. But, you know, the, some people have uh, interestingly argued that uh, G20 should have been, or, or the AC equivalent, should have been constructed in a more objective way. So, for example, the, uh, Professor Robert Wade of uh, LSE and uh, Dr. Jakob uh, Vestergaard of the Danish Institute of uh, Development uh, a few days uh, published an article in the Financial Times saying that, you know, I mean, of course, uh, you cannot have everyone, but uh, it should have had uh, more objective criteria. So they proposed that they should have had uh, countries with more than either more than 2% of world GDP or two more than 2% of uh, world population. Yeah? I, mean, I think uh, that uh, no criterion is uh, perfect and it's an interesting suggestion. So if you did that, you would include uh, countries like Bangladesh on account of having lots of people or include uh, Spain on account of uh, having yeah, more than 2% of uh, the world GDP. Yeah? Uh, it may mean that uh, you drop Argentina and so on. So, you know, uh, there are the ways uh, to structure this uh, the, the organization. Unfortunately, this was uh, basically decided by the G7 countries. Yeah? So the, it feels uh, is uh, legitimate that some you know, countries are actually quite upset about them being left out, like uh, Spain and so on. So the, the, uh, we could uh, improve this uh, the, uh, the composition. And that uh, brings me to your question, uh, aren't there just uh, going to be too many countries if we keep including people? Well, I think uh, in terms of uh, making uh, quick decisions uh, in any detail, even 20 is uh, too many. You know, look at the European Union, I mean, even with much more strict, stricter rules than uh, what you have in the G20, decision is a nightmare. I mean, you have to have like 17 interpreters and yeah, I mean, it uh, has to be a very complicated uh, negotiation process. So I don't see the, the G20 as a vehicle to make any kind of uh, effective decisions in detail, but you know, these things have uh, their functions. I mean, issues are aired there and discussed and declarations are made. None of these are likely to lead to any effective uh, kind of uh, concrete action in the short run, but I think uh, that these uh, that put things on the international agenda, but these uh, that put things uh, on people's minds. So I think uh, it has its uh, functions. Um, Korea, EU, FTA, you know, I am not an advocate of uh, free trade, but I fully agree with uh, Professor Bhagwati, the famous free trade economist, that these uh, bilateral free trade agreements are not really free trade agreements, yeah? because uh, the fact that you are signing this agreement with the EU means that you are discriminating other countries. Yeah? So uh, you sign this and have uh, the cheaper German cars, you are discriminating against the Japanese. Yeah? So, 
I mean, it's not really a free trade agreement despite its name. Uh, and also, I mean, uh, sorry, when, when I say that, some people say, well, uh, then you should uh, sign free trade agreement with everyone. Yeah? But that's going to be very costly and uh, cumbersome. The WTO is uh, uh, there exactly for that reason, so that yeah, you don't have to have negotiation with everyone. Yeah? You have one yeah, global mechanism to do that. But uh, 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 more importantly, my view is that uh, you know, free trade among countries at similar levels of development is beneficial, like the core European Union countries. But I think uh, the free trade between countries at uh, the different levels of development tend to penalize uh, the weaker countries in the long run. In the short run, it will it's uh, good for both, but in the long run, this uh, reduces the ability of the weaker countries to develop uh, the new industries, and in the long run, it uh, may not be a good thing for them. Now, is uh, Korea at the level of income where free trade with uh, the European Union is going to be beneficial? Uh, I doubt it. Uh, maybe uh, 20, 30 years later it will be at that level, but uh, I think it's uh, still a bit uh, premature. Uh, yeah, I think uh, that's all I have to say uh, to those questions. So, uh, somebody over there, yes, you, you, you raise your hand. Thank you very much for giving us such a nice presentation. I'm studying economics in Hong Kong University of Foreign Studies. And I'd like to ask you some questions about G20 Summit in the, uh, the next month. So do you think there will be an, any a real solution for currency war between China and U.S.? Recently, I, w I studied about the war between China and U.S. about their currencies. So I think that's a very um, complicated problem with the global imbalance of such a thing, do you think that will be an only possible solution which is very realistic and possible solutions which can solve the imbalance or such a problem? I think that's the question. Do you think that there will be any a real solution for that? Okay. Uh -uh. 한국말로 말할게요. 전 청신국제중고등학교 1학년 재학 중인 김예림이라고 합니다. 어, 나쁜 사마리아인이라는 책을 쓰셨는데요. 그때 그 책에서 한국 경제 성장에서의 재벌의 역할을 매우 강조하시고 옹호하셨었는데 이걸 거시적으로 바라봤을 때 세계 경제 속에서 재벌의 역할이 미국을 필두로 한 선진국들로 볼 수도 있을 거라고 생각을 했거든요. 그러니까 이런 것들이 또 다른 다르게 생각을 해보면 G20 될 수도 있겠죠. 그러니까 그렇게 되면은 선생님의 의견이 좀 다를 것 같은데 어떻게 생각하시는지 궁금합니다. I will collect uh, four more, including the ladies' question. 네, 어, LG 연구원으로 일하고 있는 이민희입니다. 어, 아까 세션 시작할 때 어, 교수들 주도로 어, 파생 상품이 새로 만들어지고 혁신 상품이 만들어질 때 새로운 방정식을 바탕으로 이렇게 더 시스템을 복잡하게 만들었다고 하셨는데요. 어, G20 같은 경우에는 음, 더 많은 국가들이 의사결정 과정에서 참여하기 때문에 컴플렉시티가 되게 증가할 것이고 어, 그 과정에서 분명히 의사결정이 어려울 것이라고 생각이 됩니다. 이래, 이에 따른 문제는 제대로 합의가 이루어지기가 힘들고 G20가 결국엔 의사결정 과정에서 영향력을 더 줄어들 수도 있다고 생각을 하는데요. 그러면 어, 중간자 역할로서 한국이 어떻게 하면 시스템을 간소화시키고 G20의 역, 어, 세계에 미치는 영향력을 어, 증, 증가시키는 방향으로 기여할 수 있을지 여쭤보고 싶습니다. 
I will only collect three more. So the back seat over there, back seat, yeah, you can. This is Kwon dong -yun from Cheongshim International Academy. And thank you for your wonderful presentation. And first of all, you have said that G20 holds a significant uh, implication in that it allows developing countries, of course, the relatively better off countries, to join the meeting. Having said that, do you think that these newly countries, including Brazil and Argentina, will have a change in their perception in like social status or economic status dif different from other typical developing countries? Okay. Ah, yeah. 강의 잘 듣고 있고요. 안녕하십니까. 저는 당국대학교 학생 이기영입니다. 어, 두 가지 질문이 있는데 첫 번째는 어, 이번 G20 회의에서 이명박 대통령께서 어, DDA에 대해서 적극적으로 될수 있도록 좀 해결 공조할 수 있도록 노력을 하겠다고 말씀하셨는데 그거에 대해서 어떻게 생각하시는지. 두 번째는 교수님께서 생각하시는 세계의 지속 가능한 성장 서로 돈만 성장할 수 있는 그런 방법 어떻게 생각하고 계시고 한국은 어떤 역할을 계속해서 해야 될지 대해서 듣고 싶습니다. 감사합니다. 마지막 한 사람만 더할 텐데요. 어, 저 뒤에 두, 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 두 번째, 예, 네, 거기, 거기 하시죠. 이걸로. Good afternoon. My name is Sang Jun Kang. I'm a student from uh, Queen Mary University of London. And then um, you mentioned that uh, Washington consensus will be replaced in the G G20 committees. So I'm just wondering if the Washington consensus be, uh, replaces to the bailout or physical and, finance, uh, physical and monetary policies, in the procedures, uh, some big countries intervene in the uh, government's procedure. It will be become another one side to fill all method. I see. Yeah. Right. Um, lots of complex uh, questions. I don't think I can do justice uh, to all the questions. Uh, yes, uh, this issue of currency war, you know, I think uh, countries have uh, such kind of different uh, perspectives uh, that it's uh, difficult to uh, see how this can be reconciled. Although, remarkably, I mean, there seems to be some kind of agreement emerging on you know, capping trade surplus. And so, you know, I mean, the Americans keep saying that the Chinese are manipulating exchange rate, but. Uh, the Chinese could also say the same about the Americans. I mean, what's all that uh, quantitative easing? I mean, it's a, a way to bring uh, the value of dollar down. Yeah? So you know, it's actually quite difficult to that, uh, say that this is uh, the right uh, exchange rate and so on. But uh, I think uh, that uh, there's enough recognition of the implications of these uh, global imbalances so the, some steps will be made, but in the end, I mean, a lot of these uh, need uh, internal structural changes. You know, the, the, the Americans keep saying that the Chinese should consume more, but you know, consumption cannot be increased uh, like that. I mean, that it uh, requires uh, income redistribution from profits to wages. People have to acquire consumption habit. There has to be infrastructure that, that, that to help consumption, like uh, the, yeah. Uh, shopping malls and so on. I mean, there should be consumer credit. I mean, these things, yeah, will eventually arrive, but uh, it cannot be done like overnight. So, you know, unless the Chinese government you know, that, that, that threatens the people with the, the, the death penalty, the, you know, I mean, I don't see how consumption can be increased uh, like that. I mean, same story with America. I mean, Americans have become, for good and bad reasons, addicted to credit fuel consumption. Yeah? So. I mean, if uh, the, you have to stop that, it creates a lot of social problems. Huh? Uh, let me try to group these uh, things uh, together. Um, yes, uh, and uh, as for this uh, question uh, regarding the decision-making structure and complexity, 
Yes, I mean, uh, it's uh, inevitable uh, that any, in any system, there is uh, a an inverse correlation between the degree of representation and the efficiency of the decision-making system. So you have to accept certain trade-offs. You know, I mean, that the most effective system will be to have a dictator for the world. But we don't want that. On the other hand, you cannot ask all six billion people in the world for their opinion on everything. So what is it going to be? I mean, maybe 20 is too large, maybe... Uh, the, it's uh, too small. Yeah? It depends on the, your perspective. So, I mean, uh, I'm not trying to dismiss the question, but uh, I think uh, the, there's no simple answer there. But I think, yes, uh, the Korea can play an important role as a country that still has a living memory of poverty, yeah? and, but that's the, the rich enough uh, to know you know, what the, the economic uh, the prosperity means. Yeah? I mean, actually, the, the, there are only a few countries that have that memory. Even in Japan, most people who are alive now the, the have forgotten about poverty. Yeah? It's only Korea, Taiwan, yeah? Singapore, and Hong Kong where those people are still alive. But all the other countries cannot really play that kind of role. So Korea has actually a very unique position and I uh, hope uh, we use it well. Now, uh, how do we ensure that, uh, gosh, I have only one minute, so uh, let me give you one broad answer which hopefully addresses uh, many of the questions. We, how do we ensure the, uh, the kind of uh, collective uh, prosperity? You know, my appeal always has been that the rich and powerful countries should act in their enlightened self-interest, yeah? not in their short-term self-interest. Uh, for example, you know, if they had a chance, probably these countries would have uh, pushed for Russian-style Big Bang reform in China back in the late 1970s. But if uh, China went down that path, it would not have grown as fast. I mean, it has used these uh, gradualist policies that has uh, that, uh, constantly changed the policies that it uses according to the stages of uh, development that the country is going through, and that is, in my view, what made uh, the Chinese experience uh, really successful. As a result of that strategy, today you have a Chinese market that's 10 times bigger than in, say, 1978. Yeah? I mean, if we used the uh, Big Bang reform, I mean, China would have grown, but probably the size will be only, say, twice bigger. Yeah? So the, the rich countries could have uh, liberalized uh, trade in China, taken all the Chinese market, but then the size of the Chinese market will be only, say, 20% of what we have today, whereas uh, that, uh, because China used those uh, gradual strategies, the rich countries, even if they take only, say, 30% of the market, that market will be bigger than in the alternative scenario. So actually, it is uh, in the long-term interest of the rich countries, too, to allow developing countries to use policies that are more appropriate for their stages of uh, development rather than imposing you know, one-size-fits-all you know, uh, the, the uniform policies. Let me leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Chang. And I'm sorry uh, not to accept more uh, comments or questions. I uh, uh, would like to really appreciate uh, uh, Professor Chang for his uh, excellent presentation, especially the view uh, from the non-G20 uh, uh, community. Uh, before I conclude, uh, I will say a few things uh, before I conclude, because uh, it may be useful to also know. The first of all, uh, to reflect the uh, non-G20 community's view, I think Korean government, uh, I'm not a government official, mm -hmm. but I know that the uh, government, uh, Korean government uh, established an ambassador at large and designate that person to go all over the place to reflect uh, the views of uh, non-G20 countries. Right. That's excellent. And uh, also uh, our president invited uh, uh, five extra countries to G20 meeting. Mm. This is the kind of uh, freedom or, or, or privilege for host country. 
he invited Spain as usual, but he didn't invite Netherlands, uh, which upset Netherlands very much. <laughs> but instead, we invited uh, uh, Malawi, Ethiopia, Vietnam, and uh, Singapore. Mm. So very many, you know, ASEAN countries and, and, and some countries from Africa. So that's uh, I want. To, I, I let you know. I, I want that's you to know. Good, yeah. And lastly, uh, about the trade policy, because I'm a trade economist, you know, trade policy and industrial policy, I think uh, Korea's argument in the uh, issue of development, uh, we want to give a, a, we want to provide a market access to developing countries rather than market access to, you know, the uh, market access to uh, uh, advanced countries mm. to developing countries. Mm. In other words, they are course, thinking yeah. about uh, G20 members. Voluntarily uh, eliminate quotas, eliminate uh, tariffs, especially for those items which will be imported from developing countries. We call mm. quota-free, duty-free kind of idea. That's also being uh, will be discussed. And uh, also, uh, developing country has some privilege even within the WTO under the uh, certain clause, yeah. so that uh, you can have uh, special and different uh, kind of uh, obligations. So we have some flexibility for developing countries. And very lastly, uh, on developing, uh, development issues, I think Korea wants to collect all the you know, new ideas. Uh, Professor Chang also mentioned some useful ideas. And they want to provide some kind of multi-year action plans. Mm. So not only this summit in Korea, but also next year in France, and then after that in Mexico, they want to add more ideas and also each year they want to monitor how these ideas are implemented. So I think we have to wait and see how these things will evolve into the future. Well, anyway, uh, this is my few comments. I, again, uh, uh, we had very uh, distinguished uh, uh, presentation by Professor Zhang. It's very useful to hear that uh, because he's well-known professor uh, not only in UK but also, you know, all community of the world. Okay, with this, I, I want to close this special session on G20. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you.